Recovery Body and National, it's our project called First Meet in this 23 academic year. And uh, our first speaker is Haunan Zhang from Austria, who is going to talk about quantum KKL Talgrand and uh, Fleetwood's theorems. Uh, please, uh, Haunan, feel free to start. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, many thanks uh, for giving me this opportunity to speak. Um, today, I will talk about some quantum analogs of uh, several results in the uh, classical uh, uh, Boolean analysis uh, um, of the so called KTL theorem, Talent Glass Inequality, and Free Good uh, Gender theorem. So, this is based on the ongoing joint work with uh, Gambi Suhuze from Technology University of Munich and Metro Worth from IST Austria. So, hopefully, the paper will appear on archive uh, before long. And um, so the plan is as follows. In the first part, I will um, briefly recall these classical results in the, um, so the, the classical bling cubes, so to say. And in the second part, I will uh, move to the quantum setting. I will explain what uh, are, what the quantum bullion cubes are in our sense and, um, and the present our main result uh, in this setup together with some applications. Uh, in the last part, I will finish with some uh, approved ingredients, uh, some questions, and some remarks. Okay, um, so let's start with uh, uh, with uh, analysis on the um, Boolean cubes, the classical Boolean cubes. Um, so um, um, one dimensional Boolean cube is just a two point space, plus one minus one. And um, for uh, by an uh, n-dimensional Boolean cube is mean uh, we mean um, the n-fold product of the two-point space plus one minus one. And throughout this part, we always equipped with a uniform probability measure, and uh, we always consider the LP norm with respect to this uniform probability measure. Um, uh, it's uh, it's an easy fact; it's well known that any function on the n-dimensional Boolean cube can be uh, uh, represented uh, uniquely using the so-called free wash expansion. So namely any function f can be written as the linear combinations of the characters chi s. So here for any s, s here is a subset of first n positive integers, f hat of s will, will denote the free coefficients, which uh, in this case is just a real number. And uh, each chi x, the character, is uh, defined as follows. So chi s of x is nothing but the product of xj, uh, where j belongs to s. Okay. Um, one important concept in the uh, Boolean analysis is so-called influences. Um, to define this, let me first re re remind you the bit flip map. So uh, for any vector in the n-dimensional Boolean cube, uh, say x, the bit flip map uh, of the gist variable, so which I will be, which I will just denote by a, this x flip j, uh, is nothing but the uh, vector, um, the n-dimensional vector, by uh, flipping the gist variable of x, and this induces a map uh, over the algebra of the function on the Boolean cube, uh, which is defined as uh, as follows. So for any function f on the n-dimensional Boolean cube, I define this f flip j. Uh, as the map, uh, as a function that flips the JS variable, okay, and I will denote by this capital DJ uh, the discrete analog of partial derivatives along the JS variables, and using this we can define the uh, so-called influences. So the influence of the JS variable of any function on the Boolean cube is defined to be the, the square of the L two norm. Um, of this dj of f. So this will be denoted by this infim of j. You can also represent this uh, uh, j's, um, the influence of the j's variable using the free coefficients, which will be the sum of a square of the free coefficient at s, where s contains this uh, variable j. Okay. So uh, in particular, when your uh, influence is, uh, is empty, is zero, and this means this simply means that the function f does not really depends on the j's variable. So that's uh, that's where this name influence comes from. And then the so, so called total influence is simply the sum of all these individual influences. 
uh, again, you can use the Fourier coefficients to represent this total influence, which will be the sum over S. S is a subset of first and positive integers of the uh, product of the cardinality of S and the square of the Fourier coefficients at S. So this is a very nice formula because this is closely related to the, to the so-called Laplacian operator on the Boolean cubes, which will be this, um, this delta here. And uh, this delta is a very important operator. Um, uh, in particular, it generates a semigroup, uh, sometimes called the heat semigroup, on the Boolean cubes, which have many good properties, which I will briefly recall. Um, so I will just recall two properties here. The first one is a so-called Poincaré inequality, or equivalently, this is nothing but the spectral gap inequality for this Laplacian operator. So this Poincaré inequality says that for any function on the n-dimensional Boolean cube, for any n, the variance of f, um, which uh, means the square of the L2 norm of f minus the mean of f, this is bounded from above by the total influence of f. So this um, this provides a lower bound, a lower bound of the total influence of the of any function actually. And uh, later we will uh, we will discuss this inequality um, uh, later. Another very important uh, inequality is so-called hypercontractivity, um, which says the the heat same group generated by this Laplacian operator. And by the way, this semi group you can also represent it as a Fourier multiplier using the Fourier expansion. So the hypercontractivity says that this semi group is actually a con is a contraction from LP to LQ uh, whenever this time t satisfies this inequality. So here p and q are are between one and infinity, and p is smaller than equal to q. So uh, this is a very very strong very strong property, and uh, this is one of the main tools in any um, many problems of uh, um, uh, on the Boolean cubes. Okay. Uh, so what is a Boolean function? So Boolean functions are, are uh, is a very special class of functions. So by the definition, a Boolean function uh, is uh, nothing but a function on um, uh, an dimensional Boolean cube that takes value only plus one or minus one. It is said to be balanced if it has mean zero uh, with respect to the uniform probability measure. So here are some examples of Boolean functions. So the first one is uh, is very simple, the so-called dictatorship. Uh, namely, this Boolean function depends only on one variable. Um, the second family of examples is the so-called kjunda, which are something more slightly more general than the dictatorships. So uh, namely, this, this Boolean function depends only on k coordinates. So namely, fx is a g of x1, of xk, uh, where g is a Boolean function um, on uh, k-dimensional Boolean cubes. So um, the dictatorship and the k-junda, they are just, uh, they are understood as very nice uh, Boolean cubes because they, are, they depend only on fewer coordinates, so their structure is much easier. And the last example is the so-called majority function, uh, which is defined as follows. So if the number of um, number of the um, plus one in the coordinates is much more than the number of minus one in the coordinates, then the majority function is defined to be plus one. Otherwise, it is defined to be minus one. Okay. And there is a very important property for the Boolean function uh is uh, is a following is a following um because by definition f takes only um uh, value plus one minus one so d for each j dj of f takes value only in plus one minus one and zero therefore the definition of the uh, influence of the j variable you can actually define it for any p so namely it is the same as a piece power of lp norm of dj of f p here is not necessary to be two um, moreover, the, the, the influence is also the same as the, probab uh, the probability, um, such that uh, um, f and the f of flip j are different. So, so this is um, it is a Boolean function and the influences. So, what is the KKL theorem? 
before stating this, uh, this theorem, let me give you some motivations. So by Pankarian quality, we have just seen earlier, for any uh, balanced uh, quantum, uh, for any balanced Boolean function, for which we know that the variance is always one, um, the total influence of F is always bounded by this universal constant one. So in particular, the maximum of the over all these individual influences is always bounded from below by one over M. Then a natural question is, um, because the Pankrain quality can be tight, so this actually provides a tight, to, uh, tight lower bound of the total influence. The natural question is whether all the individual influences can be small as simultaneously. Namely, is it possible that for any J, the influence of the J's variable is essentially of the order one over N? And uh, surprisingly, the answer is negative, which was provided by this KKL theorem. So this is uh, the KKL theorem is a seminal result by Kahan Kale and uh, Lina saying that for any balanced Boolean function F, um, the maximum influences, maximum of individual influences is actually bounded from below by log n over n uh, up to some universal constant C here. So this is an improvement of what we can say from the Pankarian quality and in particular, this is suggests that every balanced Boolean function has an influential variable. Uh, this uh, this KL theorem is a very uh, fundamental result in uh, Boolean analysis, and also has many other applications in social so, social choice theory, threshold phenomena in graph properties, uh, to name a few. Um, there are also many extensions of this theorem, which we will uh, briefly recall two of them. The so called the Talang glance inequality and the free good gender theorem. Um, any questions so far? Okay. Uh, if no, then let's continue. So, the first extension was given by uh, Talang Lang, uh, who proved the following quality where you can easily derive KKL theorem by, um, by taking the function here to be the uh, Boolean function. So, this Talang Lang's inequality says, that there exists a universal constant C such that for any dimension n and any function on the Boolean cube, n dimensional Boolean cube. So here uh, f is not necessary to be Boolean. Uh, then the variance of f is bounded from above by the up to some universal constant, the sum of uh, this kind of this type of quantities which involves the L1 influences and L2 influences. So in particular, we have this logarithm factor here, which is always uh, non-active because um, the L1 norm is smaller than equal to the L2 norm here. Okay, and if you apply this inequality to, um, to the Boolean function, then this immediately recover the KKL theorem because we have this very special property that the L1 norm of dj of f is the same of, as the square of L2 norm of dj of f. Okay, so this is the Talang Lang's inequality. Um, another extension is the so called free good Junda theorem. Um, this is, um, uh, this is, uh, this is a, about K Junda's. Uh, recall that in the KKL theorem and uh, in some other problems, so um, one basic question is to under understand the structure of a function, of a Boolean function when the influence is small. And this is K Junda theorem, this free good Junda theorem says that when your influence is small, then the function is actually close to a K Junda. Um, to state this theorem, let's first uh, start with the following observation. So, if the Boolean function is a K Junda, that is to say that it depends on only uh, K coordinates. So, K here is some universal constant independent of N here. Then it's uh, easy to see that for any K Junda, the total influence is actually uh, independent of n. Therefore, uh, this is um, some universal uh, quant uh, quantity, a uh, universal order. Um, and the frequent agenda theorem actually provides um, a converse result. So if your influence is small, then actually your, your function is actually close to some k-junda. 
more precisely for any Boolean function on the n-dimensional Boolean cube, and for any epsilon positive, then there exists some k uh, function g, uh, such that the L2 norm of f minus g is actually smaller than epsilon, where this k depends, um, the k is essentially the order two to the order two to the power total influence of f divided by epsilon. So, uh, so recall that any function depends on at most any function on n-dimensional Boolean cube depends on at most n uh, coordinates. So uh, this free good Drinder theorem is only meaningful when your total influence is small. Okay. Uh, so these are the these are the classical results on the on the Boolean cubes. Um, any questions or comments before we move into the quantum counterpart? Okay, uh, if no, then let's continue. Um, so what is a quantum Boolean cube? Uh, let's consider the simple case, so the one-dimensional case. Um, the one-dimensional dimensional, um, classical Boolean cube is just the two-point space. And the algebra of the function on the two-point space is simply a, um, a vector space of dimension two that is, uh, that is spanned by um, the function chi zero and um, uh, the function chi one. So this uh, chi empty function. So this chi empty function is simply the function that always takes uh, takes value one. Uh, so you can identify it with uh, two by two um, identity matrix. And for this chi one function, it takes uh, it maps x to x. So uh, you can actually identify this uh, function as a um, Two by two unit, uh, two by two diagonal matrix with diagonal entries plus one minus one. Then um, to quantize this one-dimensional Boolean cube, a uh, very easy candidate will be just the two by two matrix algebra, two by two complex matrix algebra that has the poly matrices as a sigma zero, sigma one, sigma two, sigma three as a basis. So in particular, this sigma zero. Is identified with is k empty. Sigma three is identified with k k one, and uh, when it comes to uh, sigma one and sigma two, things become uh, become non commutative. Uh, in general, the n-dimensional uh, quantum Boolean cube is is simply the n four tensor product of the two by two matrix algebra, which is also which is also identifies with uh, with the two to the n by two to the n complex matrix. Um, and we always equip with the normalized Schatten P norms, just like in the classical case, we always take the uniform probability measure. And uh, for this n-dimensional quantum Boolean cube, it has a natural uh, basis that is given by this sigma s. Uh, so sigma s is simply the simple tensor product of these poly matrices, and this will play the role of the characters chi s. In the in the classical setting, so uh, namely for any function on the n-dimensional quantum Boolean cube, uh, that is to say, some matrix in this uh, uh, n-fold tensor product of a two by two matrix algebra, we always have this free expansion, where a sigma s is a, is a essentially the character, and uh, this a hat of s is some complex number which is essentially the free coefficients. And the things becomes um, easier. So if we are consider only only these characters coming from the sigma zero and the sigma three, then essentially we are back to the classical system. So essentially we are consider classical Boolean functions, classical functions on the on the Boolean cubes. Okay. So the quantum case is uh, indeed uh, some something much more general. Um, now we want to define the influences just as in the classical case. Uh, for this, uh, well, the problem is that we don't have an underlying space, so we cannot simply flip the coordinates as we wish. Uh, but we can make uh, the following observation. So in the classical case, this discrete uh, partial derivatives capital DJ is defined as, as follows. So DJ of F is uh, f minus f flip j divided by two. So which is also the f minus the average of f plus f uh, flip j. 
So this part is actually taking the expectation with respect to the J's variable. Therefore, DJ of F is essentially identity map uh, minus expectation uh, with respect to the J's variable um, um, uh, to F. Therefore, we can define the quantum bit flip map as, uh, as following. So we uh, take this uh, little DJ as this um, quantum uh, counterpart of, of this capital DJ, which will be uh, simply the identity map minus some conditional expectation with respect to the J variable. So here, this I is identity map over the two by two matrix algebra. And using this, we can define the influences. So here we define for the general LP. So for LP, the LP influences is simply the piece power of the LP norm of DJ of A. We will see that one, one problem will be uh, in general, this uh, LP influences are not the same for quantum Boolean functions, which will be uh, one of the main problems for proving a quantum QQL. Uh, we will come back to this later. Okay. So, uh, so what is a quantum Boolean function? Uh, so following Montanaro and Osborne, uh, a quantum Boolean function on n qubits is a matrix uh, A in this um, uh, n tensor product of a two by two matrix algebra such that A is um, Hermitian and uh, unitary. Um, and it is said to be balanced if it has a trace zero. So again, if you consider just the diagonal matrices or just the matrices spanned by um, characters coming from um, sigma zero and sigma three, then this essentially goes back to the classical Boolean functions. So here are some examples of quantum Boolean functions. So classical Boolean functions are uh, certainly a quantum Boolean function. And uh, this uh, sigma s, these characters um, are also a qu quantum Boolean function because uh, each, uh, each um, uh, polymetric is, each um, polymetric is a quantum Boolean function. And uh, even in the single, B, uh, single uh, qubit case, so namely in, even in the one dimensional case, there are actually much more quantum Boolean functions, for example, of this type which is um, quite a different from the classical case. And uh, then the uh, question will be uh, whether we have a KKL theorem in this context. Uh, but before that, let me uh, point out one very important difference which concerns these influences. Uh, so for classical Boolean function, we know that the L all the LP influences are the same. So the influences of the JS variable you can always write it as the piece power of the LP norm of this DJ of F. But this is not true uh, for quantum Boolean functions in general. For example, the L1 influences and the L2 influences can be different. And uh, this is kind of um, um, problematic when proving quantum KKL, which we will see. And there is something uh, even worse will happen for the quantum, uh, quantum uh, influences. Uh, here we are only consider L1 influences and L2 influences uh, because uh, for the L2 influences, we know that it's, it's very nice. It is always related to the, um, to the Laplace operator because the total influence is essentially a delicious form of the Laplace operator. And the L1 influence is, is also very useful and this has already case sometimes called the geometric influences. Okay, so uh, so how about KL? Um, certainly, I mean the quality which actually we already have um, uh, due to Montanaro and Ospo. So uh, they prove that for any uh, function. On n qubits, so A here is some matrix, A is a self the joint, A has a trace zero. Then the, the variance of A, uh, which is defined by this L2 norm, the variance of A is bounded from above by this quantity, which is very similar to the classical uh, Talangolas inequality. So again, we have this logarithm factor of L2 norm divided by L1 norm of uh, DJ of A. Then the problem is follows. 
uh, when applying this quantum tolerance inequality to a quantum boolean function, uh, we do not uh, um, we uh, we do not uh, have the fact that L one influence and L two influence is the same. So um, so this part so the, on the right hand side it is uh, still some quantity involving L one influence and L two influence. So it's not clear if you can derive the KL theorem from this. And there is actually something um, something very bad will happen in the quantum setting. So there exists some quantum Boolean function A and some influence J such that the L1 norm of DJ of A is the same as the L2 norm of DJ of A. Okay, so in this case, it is said to be a bad influence. And when this happens, then this logarithmic, log, logarithmic factor will uh, simply vanish. Then this part does not improve the Pankrain quality that much. Uh, so it is not clear if you can derive a KKL theorem from this quantum Talanglas inequality, especially for this very bad influences, very bad quantum Boolean functions. So what, we, uh, what can we do? Um, let me first show you an example a bad example, uh, uh, which is actually very simple. Uh, by the way, any questions about this uh, quantum tolerance inequalities? Okay. Um, if no, then uh, let's continue. So uh, this this example is a uh, is a following. We take any real numbers, positive real numbers, alpha, beta. I have a question, Haunan. Can you go yes. back to quantum tolerance? You write trace A equals zero and you have trace in the inequality, it's just zero, right? So, uh, yeah, this is a very good point. So, uh, this part simply vanishes. So, okay. in general, um, I think this is also true, maybe for, um, yeah, without uh, trace zero assumption. But the point is uh, L2, uh, the variance is defined using L2, L2 norm. Oh, okay. Yeah. Okay. Thank you very much. Um, so how does this bad example look like? So let's take uh, two positive numbers. Oh, I'm sorry. Alpha beta such that um, alpha square plus beta square is, uh, is equal to one. Okay. Then we consider the following quantum Boolean function capital A that is defined as follows. So A is, this, is alpha times sigma zero tensor sigma one plus sigma two tensor sigma three. Okay, recall that sigma zero is just identity. Sigma one, sigma two, sigma three are the other poly matrices. Then this is a quantum Boolean function because it is clearly a Hermitian. And moreover, due to this anti uh, anti commutative relation of the sigma one and sigma three, one can easily calculate that A square is actually identity. So this uh, sigma one, sigma three equals minus sigma three, sigma one. So this is something uh, quantum, which will not happen for the classical uh, functions. Then a easy, uh, a easy calculation gives you that the, um, the D one of A, so, um, D1 of A is actually beta times this unitary matrix, sigma 2 tensor sigma 3. Therefore, the LP norm of D1 of A is always this beta, which is arbitrary number between 0 and 1. So in general, you should not expect that the L, uh, L1 influence and L2 influence for, for this capital A is, uh, is the same. And uh, furthermore, the L1 norm and L2 norm, they are the same. Therefore, this quantum Talaglans inequality is not very helpful in this sense. Okay, so this is a very a typical, very simple back example. Uh, then the problem is, do we have a quantum KKL theorem in this context? And this were, was conjectured by Montanaro and Osborne. So namely, the question is, does any quantum Boolean function have an influential variable? Um, as the as we have many different ways to define the influences, so more specifically, we consider the L two influences because L two influences are very nice. Um, and this conjecture was known for two very extreme cases. The best case, will, which will be just the classical Boolean function, which we know that it is certainly true, 
And the worst case is the bad examples, which we just have seen. So uh, there are much more bad examples of this type. Um, we know that, okay, we don't know that if the quantum KKL we just have seen uh, is, uh, is helpful or not for proving a KKL, but these bad examples have very special structures. So you can analyze them directly and, uh, and uh, Montanaro and Allspoken, they can still prove that for these bad examples, the KKL theorem is still valid. So, so this conjecture is valid for two extreme cases, then it's natural to expect that uh, it holds in general for general quantum boolean function. So uh, one of our main result is, uh, is, a, is an alternative answer to this, uh, to this question. Uh, namely, if you allow to replace this L2 influence by L1 influence, then the, then the answer is actually positive. So every balanced quantum boolean function has a variable that is geometrically uh, influential. Okay. Um, to, uh, um, to, to present the main result, to, to further explain this statement, let me start with a quantum analog of L1 pancreas inequality just to motivate the question in the L1 context. So for any matrix A in the n for tensor product n by n matrix, uh, two by two matrix algebra, then uh, the L1 norm of A minus the expectation of A is bounded from above by the total L1 influence of A up to this universal uh, factor pi here. Then as just as, uh, as before, we can argue that Okay, uh, for any balanced quantum boolean function, the maximum L1 influence is bounded from below by pi over n. Then whether, then is it true that all the individual influences are of the order pi over n uh, for, for all the j? And uh, we will see that uh, the answer is negative as long as we have the following quantum analog of L1 type uh, congruence inequality. Uh, so this inequality says, that for any such matrix, such that the uh, operator norm is bounded from above by one, then the variance of A is bounded from above up to some universal constant of uh, this sum here. So um, this is something that is very similar to the uh, Talagans inequality we have seen before, but one important difference is that it involves only the L1, uh, L1 influence. Uh, again, we have uh, some uh, logarithmic factor here. Since this only involves the L1 influence, so we don't really have the problem of the L1 and the L2 influences. Uh, in particular, if you apply this inequality to uh, balance the quantum boolean function, then immediately the maximum L1 influence of dj uh, of a is bounded from below by um, square root of log n divided by n up to some universal constant c here. Okay, so uh, this is how we can, how we prove a L1 um, version of quantum KKL. And this inequality is uh, certainly not new in the classical setting. So uh, this was probably first approved by Kela, Mosella, and Sen, and uh, was later studied by many others that uh, inspired our, our proof. Okay. Uh, okay, so having uh, L1, uh, Talanglang L1 KKL, uh, we also have a quantum analog of three good Junda theorem, which is the following. So for any quantum boolean function A um, and any epsilon between zero and two, there exists a quantum boolean function B that depends only on K coordinates. So essentially a quantum K Junda uh, in this setup such that the L1 norm of A minus B is uh, smaller than equal to epsilon um, together with this K that is um, bounded from above by this K epsilon uh, whose definition is as following. Um, that is to say when the total influence of A, so both the L1 total influence and L2 influences are small, then actually this quantum boolean function is close to some quantum K junta in this sense. Um, so uh, one application of this quantum k uh, quantum free good theorem is uh, the following result in uh, learning 
quantum pooling functions. So suppose that A is a quantum pooling function. Then give, uh, given uh, Oracle access to A, then with high probability, we can learn this quantum pooling function A uh, up to epsilon in L2 norm using this number of queries to A. So here, this number is polynomial in N, uh, also polynomial in four to the power K, where this K is essentially given in the uh, quantum free good, free good Drinda theorem. So there are some, um, previously there are some other results um, compared with their results, our, our estimate, our results here are, are much more general. You do not need to require any geometric assumptions on the quantum dynamics or, or the other assumptions. Uh, and the disadvantage is that the dependence in the epsilon is much worse. Okay. So, um, so these are essentially the, the main results. Um, so in the, in the remaining, remaining part, I will just uh, discuss some proof ingredients and some questions or remarks. Um, any questions or comments about, about the main results? Okay, uh, if no, then um, let's continue. So the proof uses, uh, the proof of the KKL uses some um, semi-group uh, techniques, semi-group properties. Um, here, the semi-group that we need is the so-called quantum deep line semi-group, whose definition is actually very, very simple. So this semi-group PT uh, is a family of very nice semi-group of uh, linear operators over the n-fold tensor product two by two matrices, whose definition is uh, very concrete. Okay, it is actually the tensor product of um, of the quantum depolarizing semigroup over the two by two matrix algebra, whose definition is very very simple. So on the two by two matrix algebra, this PT simply sends identity to identity, and sends other polymatrices sigma j to e to the power t minus t times sigma j. So in other words, this PT has a very nice um, free uh, free free multiplier um, representation. Uh, but one problem is that many property, many uh, are not uh, stable in tensor in taking tensor product in the quantum setting. Um, there are more information about this semi-group. For example, the generator is given by the sum of this partial derivative dj, where each dj is actually at important. So this is also the sum of dj square. And each pt, so pt here is a very nice semi-group, uh, the so-called quantum Markov semi-group. So it is unital, it maps identity to identity. It is positive maps, which means it maps positive uh, matrices to positive matrices. So actually there is some uh, much more stronger positivity here, which will not be uh, discussed. So it is also symmetric with respect to the Hilbert Smith inner product. Moreover, it is ergodic uh, in the sense that if your matrix A is, uh, has normalized the trace one, then PT of A will actually converse to the identity when time T goes to infinity. So you can use some semi-group interpolation argument. And we actually need more, uh, more properties of this semi-group. So uh, in particular, we need the, um, there is this Poincaré inequality. So the spectral gap inequality for this uh, uh, generator L. Uh, so the L2 influence, total, uh, total L2 influence is bounded from below by the, the variance of A. Uh, this is simple. And the hypercontractivity in this case is much more involved, uh, but um, well, in, in general for many non-commutative uh, quantum Markov semigroups, proving hypercontractivity is very difficult, but fortunately for this semigroup, uh, we do have a very nice hypercontractivity. So you can actually consider general LP, LQ here as in the classical case, but for proving uh, Palangalang KKL, uh, this LP, L2 uh, contractivity is enough. Okay. Um, and there are more estimates are, that are needed for this uh, semi-group. And these are essentially the related to the so-called the curvature or curvature lower bound. Um, so, uh, so this uh, so these notions, these notations, are present in these slides, 
uh, mostly they come from the classical Bakri Emery theory, extending the risky curvature lower bounds. So in their calculus, it's very important to uh, use this uh, so-called Gahe Duchamp operator. So uh, this Gahe Duchamp operator for this quantum Markov semigroup, uh, for this uh, quantum depolarizing semigroup, is uh, simply defined as follows. So two times gamma of A is essentially uh, defined very, uh, um, very algebraically in terms of the generator. And there are several um, important properties for, for this semigroup. So the first one is a very simple fact that you can check directly. So DJ actually commutes with the semigroup. So the partial derivative actually commutes with the semigroup. And the second property is so-called gradient estimates, uh, which essentially tells you that the risky curvature lower bound for this semigroup is, is, is actually strictly positive. So uh, um, that is to say that Gahe uh, Duchamp, so gamma of PT of A is smaller than or equal to e to the power minus T, PT of uh, Gahe Duchamp of A. So you can switch uh, the Gahe Duchamp operator and the, the semigroup up to this factor that is uh, smaller than equal to one. So it is really important that uh, here it is e to the power minus one times t. So, um, so this is to say that in some sense, the risky curvature is strictly, uh, the lower bound of risky curvature is strictly positive, which is important in some is important in some uh, estimates. So in particular, you can use this uh, gradient estimate to prove um, this inequality in the third property. So um, gamma of PT of A is bounded by some, uh, bounded by the square of the operator norm of A up to this constant depending on T. Um, so uh, this is actually uh, also classical argument, which, which, uh, which is also true in the quantum setting. Uh, this essentially follows from this gradient estimate in the second part. Okay, and the inequality on the left hand side is uh, slightly, um, slightly uh, different, so to say, uh, because the DJ here is not good enough. If the DJ is good enough, uh, that is to say, if the DJ satisfies some Leibniz rule, then this is then here it should be an equality. But the partial derivative DJ here is uh, not that nice, so the equality is not true in general. Uh, but luckily, we still have an inequality in the right direction. So uh, from this inequality, we can easily derive that uh, the operator norm of dj of pt of a is actually bounded from above by the operator norm of a. Um, oh, I'm sorry. Operator norm of a uh, divided by this, uh, uh, this factor in terms of t. Okay, so um, so these are essentially the, the the estimates needed to prove uh, needed for proving a quantum KPL. Um, let me give you a few remarks. Uh, the first remark is that uh, our results, uh, some of our results, are actually valid beyond uh, these very special matrix algebras. So um, some results are actually for general uh, are actually hold uh, valid for more general quantum algebras. So that we can also include some classical extensions of uh, Talangan's inequality as special cases. And there are more results that can be derived from um, Talangan's inequality or KKL theorem. For example, it's a qubit analog of uh, as a parametric type inequality, um, which I will not discuss further here. But one important uh, comment is that the definition of this surface area, uh, in this case, is defined using the L1 influences, which is very important. Okay. Um, okay. Um, so here, th there is this universal constant C here. <clears throat> so this is actually some quantitative version of uh, uh, quantum as a parameter type inequality. Um, uh, let me finish with a conjecture, uh, which we think is, uh, is very interesting. So uh, if you can prove this conjecture, then you can ob obtain some interesting applications in learning low-degree quantum brain functions. 
So, um, so in the most part of this talk, I discussed uh, uh, some inequality related with influences, but the, there is uh, there are other no concepts which are very important, such as a uh, degree. So um, I, I didn't define the degree of the of the of the function on Boolean cube, but we can see this uh, immediately from the definition in the quantum setting. Uh, so this conjecture is a quantum analog of the so-called bohlen bolenstein hilas inequality. Um, a classical, in, uh, classical bohlen bolenstein hilas inequality for the Boolean cube uh, can be used uh, to uh, some uh, learning problems in, uh, in learning the low degree uh, Boolean functions. And we want to do something in the quantum and uh, it seems that some recipes are already there in the quantum algorithms. But what is missing is so is the following conjecture is this quantum counterpart of bohlen bolenstein helis inequality, uh, which I will explain now. So suppose that the d is some um, positive integers, which will denote the degree of the of our polynomial. Then this conjecture states that uh, there exists a universal constant depending only on d, such that for any dimension n and any um, function on the n-dimensional Boolean cube uh, that is of degree at most d. So by saying that this function is of uh, degree at most d, we mean that this uh, capital A is a linear combination of sigma s, where the length of this s is smaller than or equal to d. Okay, so uh, the conjecture is that for any such degree uh, d polynomials, the LP norm of the free coefficients where this p is equal to this uh, to d over d plus one. So the LP norm of this free coefficients is bounded from above by the operator norm of uh, a up to this universal constant depending on the young d here. So if you uh, consider the classical um, function on the Boolean cube where k sigma s is replaced by the character chi s, uh, then this is essentially the, the classical bohlen bolenstein helis inequality, which we know is true. But in the quantum setting, some, um, some proof does not, um, yeah, some argument in the classical proof does not work. Uh, so uh, we hope that we, one can prove such an inequality. And if it is true, then one can use it in the learning low degree poly quantum Boolean functions, just as in the classical case. Um, yeah, so with this, I want to conclude my talk and thank you very much for your attention. Uh, thank you very much, Honan, for the great talk. Are there any questions? Um, so, so this is this is the algebra, right? And uh, uh, do, do, do we need all this uh, sigmas? I think sigma two is uh, just product of some of these guys, no? Um, sigma I mean, two. Okay. Um, yeah. So, so, so what is the question? Well, multiply two by is i or something like that. Um, multiply i. I. Uh, you do not recover this. You do not see this from sigma one. Is no, this your question? So we cannot. We cannot recover yeah, yeah, yeah. from from others. Other guys. No. Uh, if you want to see an well linear combination, no. But if you allow um, algebraic operations, the answer is yes. Mm -hmm. So uh, if you consider, I don't quite remember, maybe sigma one, sigma two minus sigma two, sigma one. So you consider the anti-communicator, then you should obtain some multiple of sigma three. And similarly, you can yeah do the similar anti-communication relation to, uh, derive, to, to obtain um, one of them from the other two. I mean, you certainly cannot uh, consider sigma zero here, which is uh, identity. So to uh, be sigma two, um, so sigma one, sigma three, uh, minus sigma three, sigma one, maybe it is a multiple of sigma two, I guess. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Any other questions? Yeah, I guess I guess I have a question. Thanks so much for this. Uh, talk really excited to read the, yeah. the paper when it gets posted. Um, yeah. One thing that's always struck me as a little strange about quantum Boolean functions is this hermeticity requirement. Like, I guess the the goal eventually would be to relate this to, um, you know, kind of 
concrete questions about quantum circuits and so forth. Um, but I've, I've always felt like poly decompositions don't, um, they, they don't seem to respect notions of complexity that are natural for circuits. So for instance, you can um, very easily create a, uh, you know, maximum degree Boolean function with a depth one circuit. Um, I was just curious if, you know, this, this particular, like what aspects of your work relies on hermeticity of unitary? Yeah, thank you very much. It's a very nice question. Uh, so we essentially, we are, we are just following the definition of Motonara and Ospo. Mm -hmm. And uh, there might be other, um, might be other definitions of quantum Boolean functions, uh, which I haven't seen. So I would be very interested in other notions of quantum Boolean functions. So, um, so okay, so this um, square dual identity, this is natural assumption for this uh, Hermitian um, assumption. Maybe you can also remove it. So some results in this talk are, um, are do not really need this uh, uh, A to be uh, to be self adjoint to or to be Hermitian. So maybe you can also remove this uh, the, remove this assumption. Mm -hmm. So I I don't know their motivation of Posing this uh, constraint, constraint, but uh, it 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 uh, it did make some things easier. Right. Yeah. 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 I mean, I think it's it's probably the best first place to look. Um, yeah. Great. Thanks so much. Thank you very much. Um. So I confused it. Uh, yeah. so sigma one times sigma two equals i times sigma three, on, on actually minus i times sigma three. Uh, does it matter or not? I mean, um, um, so we consider this function of the sigmas, it's algebra, we can multiply them. Mm -hmm. So in principle, we don't need all of them, right? Because if we can multiply and one comes as, as the product of others, um, yeah, it's it just, it just curiosity, so. Mm. Uh, yes, I guess in some problems, you you probably don't need uh, all of them. Um, um, uh, when- um, I, I just tried yeah. to reconcile these notations with notations of Francois Louis Picard. That's nothing, yeah, it's, yeah. it's just what, I, what I, I'm trying to do. Uh, and- um, Yes, yes. She doesn't need sigma three because she can just multiply these guys. Right, right. Yes, that's what she did. Yes. Yeah. So it's probably the same thing. Yeah. Okay. Yes. Yes. So uh, in um, uh, in the the free expansion, it will be certainly easier to uh, name it sigma three here, and uh, okay, all the sigma j's form a basis. And uh, I think it is also easier to define the degree. I actually didn't define the degree. What does it mean by the length of this S here? So, for example, in this uh, in the one-dimensional case, mm -hmm. uh, okay, any any function is spanned by this sigma j's. Then, um, so what is the degree for sigma zero? The degree is zero. You don't mm -hmm. count sigma one, sigma two, sigma three. They do. They, they all have degree one. Okay, but if but, one, sigma three is a product of two, yeah, if you if you want to, to yeah, if you want to uh, write uh, sigma three or any of them as some product of the other two, then the degree will definition of the degree will be problematic. Ah, okay, okay, okay. But al yeah. algebra is the same, but just degrees. Yes. Okay. Yes. Uh, yeah, that is for me uh, more convenient. Okay. Maybe there are some other explanations. No, no, no. It's more convenient, <laughs> of course. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you very much. Uh, how none? Yeah. Your quantum L1 Poincare inequality does not recover uh, classical L1 Poincare inequality because your right hand side is the sum of L1 influences. Yes, or, actually, uh, yes, this is a very good point. You, you, act, you can actually uh, make it stronger. So I didn't mention this. So you can also, uh, I mean, you first take the power derivative, you take the Square you take this, uh, yeah. You take the L two norm. You take the square root. So it, there is a stronger. Oh, you can, you can get that too, right? 
Yeah, you can have a stronger version which will recover the discrete analog. Okay, that's, that's interesting. In that case, the right hand side is uh, simply the L1 norm of a square root of a Cahier Duchamp of A. So this Cahier Duchamp, oh yeah, why this notation is, is useful here. Yeah. That's interesting because the proof of the classical L1 Bonker method is not simple. And I think it doesn't just follow from hypercontractivity and uh, uh, with square root with L1 bonger, with L1 gradient. So if you, if you could prove something like this uh, using what you have listed, that's that's very interesting. Um, okay, uh, let me just make myself clear. So uh, for that, um, I mean, one can recover the L1 Poincaré. For that, I mean the L1 Poincaré inequality on the discrete hypercubes. Yes, and yes. the right okay. hand side yeah. is just average of the square root of the sum of the squares of DJF squared, right? Right, that's right. That's what I mean, yes. Okay. Is, is there something like that here? Yes, so uh, this one is actually weaker, but it's uh, easier to see this from the L1 total influence. Uh, yeah, you have something stronger version which will correspond to the yeah the, the euro L one pump gradient quality on the discrete half cube. So that would be a quantum extension. Okay, that would be interesting to see when your paper gets posted. Uh, uh, okay, if uh, yeah, there are no any more questions, then let's thank the Haunam again for the great talk. And we'll meet uh, each other next uh, week on Monday.